everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Sportsbook Confidential here on FingerLakes1.com. I'm John Sullivan coming to you from the FingerLakes1.com studio in Seneca Falls, New York. And this show here is to help you learn and grow as a sports better. And got a very interesting show today because it's kind of a slow sports week for us here. Um, as you know, uh, we do a lot of football handicapping and... Except for the NFL Pro Bowl, there's no football this week. And we also like to do NHL handicapping. And it's the all-star break for the NHL. So uh, there is the all-star game this weekend. But other than that, there's no um, hockey handicapping for you. So uh, we're going to dive into a double dip of a sports book lesson. And we're going to do uh, some live handicapping today. And I'm excited about that because I'm going to just kind of go through the process of how I would, if I walked into, you know, a casino or a sports book to go place a bet, what, with no preparedness, what I would do. And you're going to see that today as we're going to review some basketball games tonight. So that's going to be very exciting. And before we get into things, I uh, just want to remind you that you can call in the show at any time and uh, to our voice message system and leave your comments, your feedbacks, your questions, your suggestions, et cetera, um, bad jokes, whatever. Uh, 1-866-315-FLX1, extension 810 is our show. There's a different extension for each program here. And I uh, look forward to uh, getting some of your calls and uh, remember that if you do call in, we may play it on the air, so so be be aware of that. Uh, so let's get to it, and as we uh, get started, let's do what we always do and update our bankroll. And uh, had an interesting week last week. Uh, the second week, we only had four plays, and uh, we ended up going two and two. Uh, the starting bankroll was six hundred and sixty-seven dollars. And on Friday night, I had two plays. I had the Maple Leafs minus one and a half goals, and they're, they were in a kind of a down a tailspin, and they had a really bad week, and, and since then they've kind of come back. But that was a loss for us. That was minus $22. And also on Friday night, we had the Senators at home plus 125 on the money line in that one, and that gave us a profit of $28. And then on Sunday, we had the two games that both went to overtime. Uh, very exciting Sunday. People are still talking about it. And we had the Rams on the money line at plus 150, and that won uh, for us for a profit of $33. And then we had the Patriots and Chiefs under 56.5, and it was 17 to 14, only 31 points scored going into the fourth quarter. And boy, what a fourth quarter it was. I think they scored 31 points total in just in that one quarter. And uh, that lost for us. So that was uh, minus $22. So even though we went two and two, we still turned a little bit of a profit. And if you look at, uh, you do the math, the new bankroll is now $687. And the bet size as we divide by 30 uh, will be going forward $23. So we're getting back closer to getting back to our original starting point. But, uh, you know, we're, we are about 20 weeks into the show and, uh, We've been doing okay. Uh, it's a long process, as I've talked about before, and that is going to tie right in to our sports book lesson. And it is two parts, and the first part is all about record keeping. And as I started in sports betting, dabbling in sports betting, uh, boy, it started with my poker playing days, I want to say, in the late 90s, early 2000s. And I bet on sports and I had some success and some failure. And how good was I? I have no idea because I didn't keep records. Uh, when I started taking sports betting seriously, uh, as I basically I, I was playing fantasy sports full time. And when I started to phase out of my full time fantasy sports, I started to get into sports betting. And that's when I started to do accurate record keeping. And that allowed me to figure out my strengths and weaknesses. And as you can see, you've got to be honest and accurate in your record keeping. Um, that is like step number one. Otherwise, it's kind of pointless to do it. Now, if you follow my bankroll system, where I divide my bankroll into 30 bets, and I keep track of that every, 
it's easy to tell if you're having a winning week or a winning month or a winning year. You just know where your bankroll is at each week. You know, we started this show with a bankroll of 750, and right now, you know, 20 weeks in, we're down to 687. So we're still down for the year or for the however long this process goes. But uh, that's an easy, quick way to say, oh, am I up? Am I down? Um, however, uh, record keeping is going to tell you where your ups and downs are coming from. Is it from hockey? Is it from football? Is it from NFL or CFL? Or uh, do you, you know, do you bet too much high lie? I don't know. Uh, but you have to own your wins and losses. And, and I feel like record keeping is part of getting your sports betting mindset right to be successful in sports betting. If you're just sports betting, you're like, I don't want to keep records. I'm just sports betting for fun. I just want to have money on the game Sunday afternoon. That is fine. But if you keep track of your wins and losses, you will be more, just by nature, uh, you will be more, uh, it will be more in your awareness. You will be more selective in your selections. Even if your prof, even if your motive is not to turn a profit, you will lose, your money will last longer you will lose less uh, because you've created awareness, awareness of where you're spending your money, how you're spending your money, how you're risking your money in your sports betting. So uh, we own our wins and our losses. And uh, at first it was really tough for me to put, you know, to, to record a bad month. And, and I, I, now I, I wear, you know, I wear it like a badge of honor. I had an 0 and 6 month in CFL this year. That was my, I've handicapped CFL for six years. It's my worst month ever, uh, and this was my first losing year in CFL in six years. But um, it's going to happen. It's just you, you. It's inevitable that you're going to have bad periods and good periods. Uh, so just as exciting it is to win ten in a row, it's just as dreadful to lose ten in a row. But you have to accept that that's part of the process here. And for a lot of people, it's very difficult for them to do. So keeping record is that stepping stone to kind of get over that hump and be able to accept the streaks either way. Uh, they will both occur in bunches. We just talked about that. Uh, as I've said in a previous pod, that uh, I think my winning streak is about 14 or 15, and my longest losing streak is about 19 wagers in a row. So it goes both ways. And you just have to tell yourself that there's going to be days when it's completely going in the other direction. And it's hard when you're in the middle of it. Uh, you know, you have, you have uh, that, that, those losses on Sunday for some people were just excruciating losses. And you, after losing so many games in so many weird ways, I, you know, I've kind of become a little bit numb to it. So when you have a losing week, when you have an 0-4 or 0-5 week, as I have had one on this podcast already, I've had a 5-0 and week and an 0-5 week. So uh, you, you get those things happen. The, the longer you're in the game, the more often they happen and the more you get used to them. And your long term record keeping will be bona fide proof of your improvement. It doesn't matter if you're really bad to just not so bad or you're break even to just a little above break even or if you're slightly profitable to very profitable. Keeping those records will show improvements. It will show that you're not wasting bets or you're not you're making fewer bad bets, uh, fewer mistakes in your selection and your selectiveness. And uh, that is one of the rewards of record keeping. Not only do you get your mindset and in, in, in your inner strength to deal with streaks, but you also can say, hey, you know, I went from minus 15 units the first year to minus five units the second year to plus three units the third year. I'm figuring this out. I'm figuring out where, you know, my strengths lie, where where the value is. And that's the, that's part of our process here that we've had all along. We need to find the value in our wagers. So uh, that's why uh, we keep records. So how long does it take to – figure out, am I doing, you know, am I, am I any good at this? Uh, do you know after, you know, after what time period? And 
That's why we're going to talk about sample size. And as the poker players say, sample size, bro. Uh, how long before you know your true level of handicapping skill? So, you know, when I started, I was not good. I, I thought that, you know, I could pick games better than the average person. And while that is probably true today, I don't know if it was true when I started out. And without understanding that the sports betting market uh, has a lot of uh, very intelligent people behind it, uh, you know, your, your, your initial choices are, you know, pretty much random success or failure. Uh, so you need, that's why this process is built around managing your bankroll, being selective, and uh, playing the long process, which includes record keeping. So is it after one week, one month, one season? After one season, is that enough to know whether I'm good or bad? Uh, I don't think it is. Uh, it's, it, you know, if you are interested in doing this for more than just fun, you know, if you're interested in doing it for any type of profit motive, or any type of long haul, even just to earn rewards from your sports book or whatever, uh, you know, you have to you have to develop a plan and uh, uh, stick to a you know obviously a budget. Um, and the the longer you can stick with it, the more accurate a picture you will be able to see of where you where you're at. Larger sample size will show signs of improvement as you learn and grow. We've kind of talked about that in the record keeping. Uh, you know, the longer you keep records, the more and more you will see how much you've improved. It will just become obvious to you after, you know, 5,000, 10,000 games that you've wagered on that, yeah, boy, I'm much better at picking these games than I was when I started. Uh, so bottom line here is my, my opinion is five seasons, uh, which can be a lot, uh, if you're a baseball fan, you know, baseball is a six-month grind. There's hundred, there's 162-game season for every team. Uh, there's a lot of baseball to bet on. And definitely football, you know, is basically once a week for 16, 17 weeks in the NFL. That uh, is a very small sample size. It's going to take a few years to even really get a handle on how good you might be just because of variance and some funny bounces of the ball may not go your way. So what I've done is I, I've show, I, I post on my Twitter timeline um, uh, my betting record every month, and I keep records, in, and I post a link to a Google spreadsheet. I'm going to put that up here now. And this is my NFL betting record uh, from the, the link to the Google spreadsheet, and I'm going to – I don't know if I can scroll down, but you can see each month for each season, the four, 2014, 15, 16, 17. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to get it to. There we go. So let me see if I can scroll it down. There we go. And you can see here, uh, I have six years of results. And the current season, uh, 2018, 2019, you know, 2019 is the playoffs, but 47, 36, and 2. Uh, plus 7.79 units. You can see I've had some up and down years. Uh, first season was break even. 2014 was up 11 units. 2015 was down a unit. And then 2016 was up 19 units. That was a great season for me. And then last year I on the Super Bowl, I had bet against the Eagles every round in the playoffs. And I ended up losing three and a half units on the year. So, um as you can see, overall, I'm 53% picking totals and spreads mostly. Um, sometimes I have money lines or other plays in there. But, uh, you know, and then 14, what does it say, 34 units over six years. That's five to six units a year, you know. And, and most sports bettors would be very, very happy with that. Um, now, you've got to remember, I only put one unit on every play. Some people say, oh, I'm up so many units, and but they bet five or ten units a play. I don't do that, so... Uh, and then I've got also, here's my CFL sheet, which I'm really proud of because of uh, I've had so many good years in the CFL. And again, I've got the same six-year spread. And this past year was actually my only losing year. 
Uh, if you folks watch the pod, remember that uh, during the Grey Cup, they had I had all my money on the Red Blacks, and it was a frozen field, and uh, that cost me a winning season. But you could say I had an amazing first year, which is probably more luck than anything else. Uh, but uh, I have, over six years, I've picked 58.67% uh, against the spread there in the CFL, and that's uh, 40 plus 40 units, which is about almost – it's between six and seven units a year. Again, who wouldn't take that? I think we'd all take that to the bank. Um, my NHL sheet, I'm down lifetime. Uh, my baseball sheet, I'm down lifetime. My college basketball sheet, I'm up lifetime. Uh, so, it, you know, we have strengths and weaknesses. But the point being that we have to uh, keep, keep those records – and accumulate a sample size to get a firm grasp of where we are going with our sports betting. So that's it for the sports book um, session. And now that we've done that, we're going to do something completely different. And I'm going to go off the screen as uh, we are going to handicap some basketball games. Now, it's uh, Friday night. Uh, as as we've discussed in the pod, the Saturday games are the spreads are not out, so there's nothing I can really do other than guess the spreads for the Saturday games. But there's three decent Friday games tonight, and I'm actually just going to handicap them right now. I haven't really looked at, you know, I, I I've looked at the spreads and stuff, but I haven't looked at uh, the underlying stats and information to decide on a pick. But I'm going to pick these three games right now, and these are going to be my three picks this week. So this is kind of exciting for me. So what I am going to do is I'm going to start with uh, number six, Michigan, at Indiana. And I'm going to make the thing bigger here. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the spread and it is four and a half uh you can't see that on the screen but it's four and a half and uh 133.5 is the total and this uh what this web page i have up here is covers.com and it's their matchup page for each game and it has a lot of uh valuable information at your fingertips and i'm looking at this right now and we're going to uh, make a pick on this game. So uh, one of the things that I like that this has is there's certain stats on this page which I completely ignore, and there's other stats which I find very useful. And I'm going to show you the stats on this page. Uh, as you can see where the Michigan and Indiana logos are, uh, these are what they, they're called consensus picks. And if I can, the mouse doesn't want to help work here. There we go. So as you can see, um, uh, the consensus picks, those are people that pick these games, and we have no clue if they're any good at it, and we're just going to say goodbye to that. Uh, over here on the left-hand side, you have the line history, and you can see that's not really useful to what we're going to do here today, but that's information. Then you have what are trends, and I've talked in a previous pod about not betting on trends, and there are very few trends that I would bet on, and so I pass by that. And then previous matchups outside of this season, they have absolutely no value to picking this game, so in my opinion. So other they this these two teams have already played once this year, and Michigan won by 11, and it was 137 was the total. So... And then you have the last 10 games for each team, and I find this, this to be actually useful. Um, you can see uh, that Michigan has won nine of their last 10, and you can tell if, uh, how, if they've, you know, they, how they've shot and how they've rebounded, and the same with Indiana. And it looks like Indiana's on a five-game losing streak. And then down here at the bottom of the screen, you have the last game starting fives. And you have any player news or injuries at the bottom here. And you can see that Indiana's had a lot of players out for this game. 
but where I find the most value is some of these statistics down here on the right hand side. And you can see uh, each team, they have their uh, average points per game and their field goal percentages and their free throw percentages. And people always ask me what is most important in handicapping college basketball. And to me, it's two things are free throw shooting and coaching. Um, if you want a team to cover, they have to be able to hit free throws because every game comes down to that. Every game comes down to a team uh, that's ahead and the team behind must follow them to get the ball back. And in order for them to keep their lead or to cover their game, they have to hit their free throws. So you look for the team that you're going to bet on to have a free throw advantage. And in this game, uh, you can see that these teams are about dead even and they're both bad free throw shooting teams at about 65%. Um, and you can look at their home and away splits and then their last five games, uh, which is kind of nice because if the lineups have changed over the last five games, you can see if it makes a difference in their overall stats. Uh, these are nice handy little snapshots. So, you know, if I was on a trip to Vegas and I wanted to walk into a sports book and place a bet on this basketball game, this is the page I would pull up and look at it for a few minutes, review a few things, and decide on what type of bet to place on this game. So uh, as I look at this, I see that Michigan is significantly a better defensive team than Indiana, um, and they do a significant job of allowing um, – these teams are pretty much identical in free throw shooting, identical in rebounding. Uh, uh, Indiana seems to be the better field goal percentage team, but not at, from the inside, not from the outside. So the, the defense is, is the difference here for me. I see Michigan as 10 points better on defense. And uh, I, I feel like that that is the deciding factor in this game. Uh, these teams... Indiana has not put that many the, – the, the number the – ton, the totals are tough for college basketball because the books do not allow a lot of money on totals. You could walk into, you know, a sports book in New Jersey and depending, you know, which one they could say $250 on basketball, college basketball totals. And those, those lines are only up for a few hours. They're, you know, they're up – they'll be – the games for tomorrow, those lines will be up you know, nine, 8, 9 o'clock tomorrow morning for the totals. The spreads will be up tonight. But this total is somewhat appropriately lined. It could go to 140. It could stay under. Um, I think I'm going to pass on the total, and I'm just going to pick Michigan plus the 4. I'm uh, sorry, Michigan minus the 4.5 on the road. Uh, obviously, a top five team. Um, Indiana's had all kinds of troubles. Uh, Michigan has their full complement of lineup, and they've come up with a rebound wind after their horrible loss last week. So Michigan uh, minus 4.5. That's going to be my first play. And then the second game we have is number 14, University of Buffalo Bulls at Buffalo Bulls at Kent State in some action. And again, we've got uh, all this stuff at the top of the screen that we don't really pay attention to. Actually, right below the title is uh, – is a little quick in short it says there um has a time of the game the team's records against the spread records home and away records conference records which is important to me uh and then your average for and your average against and then their over unders uh and this game is lined at uh buffalo plus eight and a half or buffalo minus eight and a half and 162 is the total. And as I look through these two teams, uh, I notice that Kent State, even though a lot of their games have gone over, they their games have almost never touched 160 points. Uh, you can see the game against Toledo that went to overtime. That was over. But all their other games in their last 10 games – pretty much have not hit 160. 
uh, on the other, you know, the other side, even Buffalo, their last 10 games, only a couple have hit 160. Uh, I see one, two, maybe three out of the last 10. So I kind of like the, the under here at 162. Uh, we don't really have any, you know, Buffalo's got their starting five, all seniors. And as you look at the stats here, oh, excuse me. As you look at the stats, we have, um, you know, it's, it's pretty accurately, accurately lined. You got Buffalo averaging uh, about eight more points on offense and giving up three points fewer on defense. Uh, both teams are good free throw shooting teams, which is bad for the under. You want, you know, they're both shooting 70% as a team, which is good, not great, but, um, and their field goal percentages, their team field goal percentages are pretty high. Uh, which means that they probably like to uh, shoot inside and in, in more a little more tempo. Um, so in the last five games, you can see that uh, both of these teams, Buffalo's uh, for and against, if you add those together, come to about 160 and... Kent State's comes to about 150. So I, I'm pretty sure this is going to be the one under 162 for me. So that's my second. That's my second pick. And then finally, the last game of the night, we got a Big East matchup. Butler at Creighton. Uh, don't know much about these teams at all. So uh, we're going to take a look here and see what we got. Uh, two teams that are have losing records in the conference. Uh, the Big East has been very competitive this year. There's no been no like huge standouts, uh, so I'm I'm really looking at these teams for the first time. The other two teams I followed earlier in the season. So um, we've got uh, Creighton with uh, geez one two three four five losses in the last ten. One two three, both of these teams five and five in the last ten, and so you got Creighton minus two and a half at home. And the total 153. Uh, both teams have uh, just long-term injuries there, nothing recent. And we've got, boy, we've got some high-scoring offenses here. Creighton averaging 82 points a game. Butler averaging 74 points a game. That's 156. Uh, we've got, uh, well, Creighton doesn't shoot free throws that well, 67%. Uh, and their defenses both give up a ton of points. So my play in this game, you know, this is my quick and dirty, is I'm going to take the over 153 here. Uh, so that's going to do it for my quick live handicapping. I don't know if we'll do that again, but... Uh, uh, just to recap my picks, because I didn't know them before we started the show, we're going to go with Michigan minus 4.5. We're going to go with um, Buffalo and Kent State under 162, and Butler and Creighton over 153. So that's going to do it uh, for this week. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Next week we're going to have a huge uh, Super Bowl preview. We'll talk about prop bets, I'm sure, and we'll have some great sports betting news as uh, uh, the New York State Gaming Commission will uh, have us hearing on the sports betting. So lots to talk about then. So uh, I'm going to play the outro music. So uh, thanks for watching. Let's get some winners. <laughs> See you next time.